Good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, the president of the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. Passing on to me was Alyssa Kaplan, our prior president, who's been phenomenal, and David, who's been uh, her total wonderful teammate and terrific. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have a wonderful program for you all today. Um, I'd like to thank in particular, uh, Marcy Schoenfeld, who is in charge of our programming. Excuse me for a frog in my throat. And uh, we are gonna have a wonderful program with Stephen Fisher and with Sheldon Goldberg. And I'm gonna turn this over to David, who is gonna moderate the program. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Peter. A warm welcome to you all. We are pleased to have such a great crowd in attendance this morning. It's now my pleasure to introduce Steve Fisher, commander of our local Jewish war veterans, Fred Robbins Post 142 here in Stanford, co-sponsor of today's program for some words of welcome. Steve. Good morning, everybody. I wanna welcome everybody and, and thank you for your attendance. I think we're in store for a very uh, interesting tour today of uh, something that most of us, I don't think I've had a chance to visit. And I look forward to uh, a wonderful tour uh, for over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's great to have you here as well as so many members of our JWV post. Now, I am truly honored to introduce our speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Sheldon Goldberg, PhD. Colonel Goldberg is a highly decorated 30-year U.S. Air Force veteran, having served in many important positions during his distinguished career. He was both a navigator and a weapons systems officer, flying both the F-4 and F-111 fighter jets, accumulating more than 5,000 total flying hours, a tremendous feat. Colonel Goldberg flew 214 combat missions in Southeast Asia with the only night dedicated fighter squadron in the Air Force, earning two distinguished flying crosses for valor and 17 air medals. Indeed, the complete list of his awards and decorations would fill nearly half a page. He spent half his career in Europe, serving in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and twice in what was then West Germany, the latter assignment as the US Air Force advisor to the Commandant at the German General Staff College. Upon his retirement from the Air Force in 1985, he joined the Central Intelligence Agency, retiring after 16 years in 2002 and earning a Career Commendation Medal. In addition to two master's degrees, he holds a doctorate in modern European history from the University of Maryland, which subsequently led to his being named docent and historian at the National Museum of American Jewish Military History in Washington, D.C. There, he lectures on the participation of American Jews in the U.S. military since pre-colonial times. Colonel Goldberg is active as an officer in many veterans organizations. Among these, he currently serves as commander of the JWV Greenberg Learner Post 692 in Rockville, Maryland. A true Renaissance man, Colonel Goldberg was the technical editor and wrote the foreword to Jewish aviators in World War II a book by Bruce Walk. His dissertation was published in book form in 2017. Colonel Goldberg is an accomplished musician and early in his military career, played in the Air Force Band at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. Colonel Goldberg is married to Waltred Reinhardt. They have two children and three grandchildren. The Goldbergs reside in Silver Spring, Maryland. Sheldon, the floor is yours. Thank you much, David. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you all in Stanford for, uh, I don't know, at least for me, getting up early to uh, be here at 10 in the morning. I've got uh, my own chapter meeting, post meeting rather, here following this. Um, this morning, uh, I guess my task is to take you on a tour of the museum. Uh, we have a, a 26 <coughs> and a half minute video uh, featuring uh, Michael Ru Mike Rugel, who is the uh, basically the director of programs at the museum, and I guess in a sense my uh, my boss, even though I don't get paid, but uh, and I'm in there as well. We'll uh, go through the museum, and then afterwards uh, we'll have a question and answer if you would like. And uh, I'll be here at least until uh, eleven o'clock when I have to go start my own meeting. Here we go. Thank you. 
I'm Colonel Jack Jacobs, Army veteran and Medal of Honor recipient. Welcome to the National Museum of American Jewish Military History, where we maintain the legacy of the Jews who have served in the American military. The museum traces its roots to 1896, when the Hebrew Union Veterans Association was created as a response to the old canard that Jews hadn't served in the Civil War. In fact, thousands served on both sides. This organization grew, combined with other Jewish veterans groups, and in 1928 was renamed the Jewish War Veterans of the USA. In 1958, JWV worked for a congressional charter for a shrine to honor Jewish contributions to the American military. This shrine eventually became the museum, now housed in this building, which opened in 1984 when Vice President George H.W. Bush came to affix the mezuzah to our doorpost. These are the stories of men and women who fought and sacrificed for their country and of those still serving. The stories of Jewish immigrants becoming American, of Jewish brother against brother fighting in the Civil War, of American Jews setting forth to fight against those who sought the destruction of the entire Jewish people. The stories of Jews in the American military are the stories of America itself. Asser Levy was a leader of the first Jewish community in what would become the United States. In New Amsterdam, Levy was told guard duty on the wall was the responsibility of every citizen. However, according to Governor Peter Stuyvesant, as a Jew, Levy was excluded from this responsibility. Stuyvesant's policy forced Jews to pay non-Jewish burghers to serve guard duty in their place. Levy and his fellow Jewish settler, Jacob Bar Simpson, successfully appealed to the Dutch West Indy Company to overturn Stuyvesant's policy and allow Jews to stand guard. Levy thus became the spiritual forefather to all Jewish Americans who would serve in the American military in the years to come. The Jewish population in America was still quite small by the time of the American Revolution. Still, there were several notable officers who served in the new nation's quest for independence. Francis Salvador of Charleston was the first identified Jew killed in the Revolutionary War. Sometimes referred to as the Southern Paul Revere, Salvador rode 30 miles giving the alarm that an attack was coming from British allied Cherokee Indians. He was later wounded in battle and died at age 29. When war broke out against the British for a second time, American Jews were there. Uriah Levy first came to prominence in the War of 1812. He eventually became a Commodore. He would have been the highest ranking Jewish officer of his day. Within the Navy, he's known as the man who led the effort to abolish flogging. Uriah Levy thought that that destroyed morale. Outside of the Navy, Uriah Levy is best known as the man who rescued and restored Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Thomas Jefferson died in a large amount of debt. Monticello had fallen into disrepair. The building itself was rotting. And in 1836, Uriah Levy bought the Monticello estate. And he and a nephew led the effort to restore it. The Civil War pitted American brother against brother 
and for American Jews, this was no different. Many of those in service were German immigrants, but North or South, they were assimilating to the American way of life and supported their side. An estimated 3,000 served in the Confederacy and 7,500 in the Union. Stories abound of Jews serving in all capacities, heroes and those just doing their parts. American Jews served for the Confederate Army. Probably the best known Jewish military man in the South was Abraham Myers. Abraham Myers was born in South Carolina and had attended and graduated uh, from West Point. He served in the Seminole Wars and in the Mexican-American Wars for the U.S. Army. When the Southern States seceded, he resigned from the U.S. Army and immediately joined the Confederate forces. He, like other Southern Jews, were, were, were people of their time and place. They were largely assimilated, and for him, yeah, when the time came, he was going to be with the, the Southern States where he was from. On the other side of the war, Marcus Spiegel served in the 67th and 120th Ohio Volunteers. He was promoted during his experience in the Civil War, ended up as a colonel. Marcus Spiegel wrote a, a pretty extraordinary set of letters to his wife that have since been published. And Marcus Spiegel also wrote about some important Jewish issues, including being in the South, in Norfolk, Virginia. He wrote about attending Rosh Hashanah services with the Southerners who they were at war with. Spiegel was part of the Red River Campaign in Louisiana, and when Confederate forces attacked the ship he was on, Spiegel was killed in 1864. At least four Jewish Americans earned the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Benjamin Levy, David Urbanski, Abraham Cohn, and Leopold Karpulis. Now, Leopold Karpulis was a Czech immigrant that went down to Texas to live with his brother. And he got very upset with the way blacks were treated down there and joined one of the Massachusetts regiments. And during the Battle of Wilderness, the Confederates were pushing the Yankees back. He got up on the tree stump and started waving the flag. And the commander of the division came running up on his horse and yelled out, you know, rally around the flagpole. And that apparently got the division together and they were able to repulse the Confederates. He was cited for that. The interesting thing about it was years later, he actually petitioned Congress. He had to petition Congress for his Medal of Honor, which he succeeded in getting. Amongst the important developments during the Civil War was the appointment of the first three Jewish chaplains to serve in the American military. There was a Pennsylvania regiment, and as a regiment, they were able to elect their chaplain. Uh, this is one of the more unusual regiments in that it had a Jewish commander. The majority of the soldiers were Jewish, and they had elected a young Jewish soldier who was a very well-educated young man to be their chaplain. And one day, a visitor came from the Young Men's Christian Association, virtually outraged at the fact that a Jew was the chaplain. The Army regulation at the time authorized chaplains of recognized Christian faiths and who had been gentlemen who had been given also bona fides uh, by their congregation to be chaplains. An official went to uh, President Lincoln, told him the situation. Uh, it took a while, but President Lincoln conceded and saw to it that the regulation was changed so that it would allow chaplains from any recognized religion. The U.S. entered World War I in 1917. An estimated 225,000 American Jews would serve in the war. They served in every service branch of the armed forces. American Jews became ready to sign on to fight Germany. According to the American Jewish Committee Office of War Records, 40 to 50,000 American Jews volunteered for service. With such a large number in service, an organization was needed to serve the religious needs of American Jewish soldiers and sailors. The Jewish Welfare Board formed to manage Jewish chaplains in the military, print prayer books for Jewish soldiers and sailors, and contribute to morale in any way they could. Many Jews in service were immigrants from Eastern Europe, like Elijah Weisbram, whose parade helmet is seen here. Weisbram was a Russian immigrant who was drafted prior to becoming a citizen. 
He was with the 307th Engineers of the 82nd All-American Division. He saw action at San Mihel. The brutal terms of military service in the Russian Empire had been a reason to escape. In America, almost all of these same immigrants registered for the draft without complaint, including Abraham Krotoshinsky, who helped rescue the famed Lost Battalion for which he received the Distinguished Service Cross. Many received their citizenship while serving in the military, like Philip Klampus, a Russian immigrant who served with the 313th Infantry in France and was naturalized while serving at Camp Greenleaf in Georgia. Women also joined the service during World War I. Jewish women served in several capacities, including army nurses like Ethel Gladstone and Mina Barrow. There were also marinettes in the Marine Corps and Navy Yeomanettes like Sally Shackman. Kate Karpelis was the daughter-in-law of Civil War Medal of Honor recipient Leopold Karpelis. Kate Karpelis was a Johns Hopkins graduate medical student, a doctor who became the first female contract doctor signed on by the United States Army. She served in Washington, D.C. in a hospital here till approximately 1920. Another Jewish lady who served was a woman by the name of Minnie Goldman, who came from Chicago. She was one of about 400 plus AT&T bilingual telephone operators, later given the name Hello Girls, who served in France. Unfortunately, the U.S. Army treated these ladies very poorly. They had to buy their own uniforms. And when the services were over, even though they had taken an oath, they were told they were contractors, and as such, the Army owed them nothing. Four Medal of Honor recipients served during the First World War. Sidney Gumperts, Benjamin Kaufman, William Sarlson, and William Shimon. William is one of four World War I Jewish soldiers who received the Medal of Honor. In France, during World War I, 1918, he left the trenches on three separate occasions under very heavy machine gun and rifle fire to go out into no man's land and bring back wounded soldiers. As a result, William Shemin got the Distinguished Service Cross. He subsequently got a Purple Heart. His family, however, and friends thought that he deserved more than the Distinguished Service Cross. And they uh, wrote up the William Shemin Jewish War Veterans Bill. And on the 2nd of June of 2015, William Shemin, at least his daughters, uh, received the Medal of Honor On December 7th, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor ended American World War II neutrality. Within the American Jewish community, there was an even stronger desire to fight in Europe as Nazi policies toward Jews continued to worsen. Approximately 550,000 American Jews served in World War II. Morris Gordon was a, a rabbi. He uh, was born in Poland, in Russian-occupied Poland, came to the U.S initially enlisted in the army before taking a commission as a Jewish chaplain. He was for a time the only chaplain along the Burma Road. He serves in the China Burma India Theater. The story behind the arc is Chaplain Gordon was traveling in a Jeep that's hit by a bomb. It instantly kills the driver of the Jeep and it throws Chaplain Gordon into a river alongside the road that they're traveling on. Uh, fortunately for Rabbi Gordon there's a Chinese officer close enough to see what had happened. He rushes over, he pulls Rabbi Gordon out of the river, saves his life. Chaplain Gordon survives. Unfortunately, everything he uses for Jewish services in the field is destroyed. But while Chaplain Gordon is recovering from his wounds, he develops a relationship with this Chinese officer who had saved his life. And this Chinese officer ends up building him this ark out of teak wood, and Rabbi Gordon is able to use it to carry a tour, conduct Jewish services in the China Burma India Theater for the rest of the war, and it becomes a prized possession in his home for the rest of his life until he passed away in 2005. Louis Ligdortz was uh, flying over Germany on April 22nd, 1944. He was shot down. He ends up imprisoned at Stalag Luft III. In this POW camp, he begins 
to keep a diary. This diary shows the German rations, the amount of food they got for a week, which had them uh, above a starvation diet, but not much. You see, three ounces of meat is on the list. That's for a week. In World War II, you would, if you had a religious identifier in your dog tag, it would have been H, a P, or a C. You were Hebrew, Protestant, or Catholic. Those were the three religions that were known to the military at the time. For those going to Europe and knowing what Nazi policies were towards Jews, whether you wanted that H on your dog tag was something that you would have to think about. One of the most frequent questions we get is, is what happened to these uh, Jewish American soldiers that were prisoners of the Nazis? Were they made victims of the Holocaust? And most typically, they, they were not. The Jewish soldiers were often treated the same as other American soldiers. The most notable exception to that was a camp called Berga where 350 American soldiers were sent and about 20% of them were Jewish, so you know, way higher than you would have gotten from any kind of random sampling. And those 350 Americans were made slave laborers right alongside European civilians. At the end of the war, the Germans took them on a death march and a huge number of them were killed. And that's the, you know, the one true Holocaust story as it applies to a group of Americans. This camera here sort of gives us a lens into another aspect of Jews in the military. In particular, what we're looking at is a camera that was owned by Sergeant Karl Heinemann, a German immigrant who was able to escape Germany in 1938, along with many other German Jews who came to the United States before the war began. And because of the nature of the freedom that they were able to have here in the United States that they would have lost in Germany, elected to enlist in the United States military and give back to this country. Many of these other German Jews wound up uh, at Camp Ritchie, uh, became part of a famous group known as the Ritchie Boys because of their linguistic abilities. They became interpreters, they became intelligence officers, some of them behind the lines as spies, all of them in the desire to do in the Nazi empire and give back to the United States for what they felt they had earned and deserved. As Americans reached further into Europe, they discovered the horrors of Nazi concentration camps. There had been rumors of Nazi atrocities. American Jewish GIs played an important role. They reported to the world what they saw. They were often Yiddish speakers, the only ones who could communicate with survivors. Everybody was clad in these pajamas with black and gray stripes. So they were frightened, and I, I said, Hat mich kein Angst, this is a Yiddish hunt. And I, they still were afraid. And then Chaplain Bolin said, Ich bin <coughs> This always gets me. Ich bin an Amerikaner Rabbina. I am an American rabbi. And uh, it's as if all of the emotions had been unleashed. There are three Jewish Medal of Honor recipients from the Second World War. Raymond Zussman, Isidore Jackman, and Ben L. Solomon. Ben was a dentist. He was a graduate of the University of Southern California Dental School, who enlisted in the Army, received an infantry training. But when the Army found out that he was a dentist, they pulled him out of the infantry, gave him a commission, and sent him into the Pacific, where he wound up in Saipan, at the beginning of the largest land battle in the Pacific. He was in charge of a aid station right at, in the front lines, basically. He was made battalion medical officer, but he stayed where he was, and the Japanese then overran the American lines. They broke into his aid station there and began bayoneting and shooting the wounded soldiers in there. He himself then grabbed the rifle and started to defend them to the best that he could. He ran out front of the tent and found a machine gun emplacement where the Americans manning that had been killed. He took over the machine gun, 
when the Americans came back the following day after they were able to push the Japanese back, they found him dead, slumped over the machine gun, and approximately 90 Japanese bodies sort of piled up in front of it. And he was immediately put in for the Medal of Honor. Uh, but it was turned down because Benjamin Solomon was a medical officer. And according to the Geneva Conventions, medical officers are not supposed to be involved in offensive operations. The argument, however, was made that he was not involved in offensive operations, but he was involved in defensive operations. The chapel is a place for contemplation or prayer. Named for Chaplain Joshua Goldberg, Joshua Lewis Goldberg was born in 1896 in current-day Belarus. He was the first rabbi to be commissioned as a U.S. Navy chaplain in World War II, the first to reach the rank of Navy captain, and the first to retire after a full active duty career. Goldberg had served as a private in the Russian Army in 1916 before coming to the U.S. Chaplain Martin Weitz created this portable ark, guided by that biblical reference. After World War II, U.S. foreign policy came to be defined by opposition to communism and Cold War with the Soviet Union. Beginning in 1950, the undeclared Korean War brought many Americans to the country divided at its 38th parallel to combat the North Koreans and their Chinese and Soviet allies. Leonard Kravitz and Tiber Rubin received the Medal of Honor for actions in Korea. Rubin was the only Holocaust survivor and Medal of Honor recipient. The extended war in Vietnam saw millions of American soldiers sent to Southeast Asia. Though anti-war sentiment was high from the soldiers' perspective, they were there with a job to do and responsibilities to fulfill. Both volunteers and draftees fought with that purpose. Jewish Americans served as all other Americans did. Paul Zondervan was a Marine serving with the 3rd Marine Division in Vietnam in 1967. He was stationed at Phu Bai, and they were holding Jewish high holiday services in uh, Da Nang. So he made the trip down. At these services, they were handing out these camouflage kippot, yarmulkes. They were made from the same material that they made these camouflage tents from, and they created them specifically for these high holiday Jewish services. Jewish services were often a little taste of home, a little taste of the culture from home, and these services really were a way for the men to, to reconnect uh, with themselves as something of a refuge from war. Jack Jacobs and John Levitow earned the Medal of Honor in Vietnam. John Levitow was a young Airman First Class. He was a crew chief on a gunship, an AC-47 gunship that one night was circling over a special forces camp in uh, the northern part of South Vietnam. At one particular point of the flight, a mortar shell hit the airplane and blew a hole in the fuselage. John was uh, riddled with shrapnel in his back, 40 some odd wounds, uh, bleeding, and the loadmaster, who was the one that would throw out the flares, had a flare in his arms and was, had armed it and was getting ready to throw it out when the mortar shell hit and dropped it on the floor. Levito, sliding in his own blood, made several attempts to get it. He finally was able to grab a hold of it and threw it out of the airplane just as it ignited, saving both the airplane and the crew. And for these activities, of course, he was awarded the Medal of Honor.
Americans were brought to the Middle East to fight for the Gulf War in 1991. Among the Jewish Americans sent there was Rabbi Bonnie Coppell, the first female Jewish chaplain to serve in the U.S. military. The conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan that arose after September 11, 2001 have brought more men and women into dangerous roles. At least 57 Jewish Americans have been killed in service. It's important that we remember the contributions Jewish Americans have made to our country's defense. Regardless of stereotypes, the record of Jewish service is a proud one. Here at the National Museum of American Jewish Military History, we'll continue to tell the stories of my comrades who've served in the armed forces. Well, thank you, Sheldon. That was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, review. And uh, really appreciate all the effort that went into the making of it. Uh, we'll now open up uh, for questions. Uh, you can either raise your hands uh, electronically, or uh, if you're unfamiliar with that, you can raise your hands the old fashioned way, or put in uh, a, a question in the chat box. While we're waiting, Sheldon, a, a, a couple questions as I was watching that movie. Um, the actual production of it, uh, clearly a very professional uh, movie. Uh, you were involved with the script. How, how did you uh, determine what to put in there with a vast array of material available? Well, actually, I have really very little to do with it other than <laughs> the speaker. I think the pieces that I got are the uh, pieces that I'm most familiar with, uh, the stories. I mean, obviously, they were all truncated because of time and everything. Uh, some of the stories are, are much, much longer and uh, tell a little bit more about not only the individual, uh, but uh, just what was going on back in those times. Uh, we mentioned that uh, Leopold Carpellis uh, had to petition for the Medal of Honor. Uh, when the Medal of Honor first came out in 1862, uh, there were something like 2,000 medals authorized. Uh, 1,600 of them uh, were, were awarded, if you will, if you were, for an example, in uh, President Lincoln's funeral cortege, you got a Medal of Honor. There was a battalion, apparently, that re-enlisted. They got the Medal of Honor. Uh, all sorts of people petitioned for it, thinking they deserved it. It wasn't until about just before World War I that an Army commission decided we needed to tighten the regulations up and pulled back about 800 of these Medals of Honor that had been handed out. Uh, Carpolis had uh, a much longer uh, history in the uh, military. He actually served in two different Massachusetts regiments, did a lot of things uh, that he was cited for. And when his, he did petition five years later, and it was, of course, uh, approved. Uh, that's just, just one example of the stories that, that we tell. Very interesting. Uh, Debbie Zuckerman, I think you had your hands up, did you? Yes, I was typing a question. Is there anything there about Operation Fortitude in the World War II? My no, thought. I don't think we don't deal necessarily with those things. We deal primarily with individuals who served. Okay, uh, Howie. Good morning. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, my question was, and and. I've always been like a uh, war bug, you know, following these things. Was there not a Jewish soldier? He didn't get a, a medal 
that was on the flag raising in Iwo Jima? Uh, that I, to be honest, I do not know. You're supposed to. <laughs> I know. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm supposed to, but uh, well, it looks like. But I will. I will. Is... I will find out. I will write that down. I will find out and get back to David with the answer. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. David should know it too, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Howie. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think the Ginsburgs have a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring program about Jewish war veterans. I want to know, does the museum cover uh, General Grant's uh, Order 11 expelling the Jews from uh, Kentucky and Tennessee during the Civil War? No, we don't. I mean, it's part of the history, obviously, but uh, again, that's not something that deals specifically with the military. What he was expelling was, of course, the the uh, the, the salespeople, the contractors, things of that nature, because of his belief they were making profit and so on. And if you're aware of that, you know, then that President Lincoln did countermand that order. But that's not one of the things that we particularly cover. There was uh, one Jewish officer from uh, Illinois who uh, resigned his commission after uh, having to help expel Jews from the area? Again, I can't, I can't answer that question. Okay. We have a question at uh, chat box from uh, Gail G. Trell. Thank you, Sheldon. This video is so well done. It makes a person to want to visit the museum. Is it open for visitation now? The, the museum is open. Uh, last night they opened up on the 8th of April, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I guess it, I don't know if it's open every single day. I know it's open at least on Mondays. Uh, our suggestion is particularly if you're going to come, come with a group or something, let somebody know beforehand. Uh, and if you have a group, I think right now, I don't know what DC allows. Maryland now allows up to 50 people, uh, but um, call ahead and uh, get a date and a time. And uh, if I'm available, I will come by and lead the tour. Otherwise, it's pretty much a self, self tour type thing. Mm -hmm. Follow on question that Sheldon, uh, DuPont Circle area, what about parking? No, <laughs> that's, that, what that's the worst part of it. No, uh, we are trying our uh, level best to convince the, those uh, in power, if you will, to sell the building that the, that the museum is in, and they can make a lot, a lot of money out of that being located where it is, mm -hmm. and move someplace where there is parking available. Right. And that's um, the biggest problem. Yeah, so Metro, best approach? Metro, Uber, taxi, whatever, 1811 R Street, Northwest. Well, I see things haven't changed since we were there years ago. No. <laughs> okay, let's see, Ann Rosenbaum. She's still muted. And you'll need to unmute yourself. We'll, we'll come back to uh, Ann and Hal in a minute. Uh, uh, Jerry Krantz, you have a question. Uh, actually, a comment. I remember as a kid growing up in Brooklyn that the pilot Maya Levin took off on December 7th in his fighter plane. Um, uh, against the Japanese forces and was the first person killed uh, from Brooklyn um, on that date. Hmm. Thank you for that. We have a question in the chat and then Brenda, I'll get to you. Uh, you mentioned that the allowing of recognized religions given differences of states recognition, acceptance of Judaism how was it determined when Judaism would be recognized on, say, the federal level? Well, I don't think it was a question of being recognized on a federal level. It was a question of individuals. Uh, and again, this was union only. There were no Jewish uh, chaplains in the Confederate military. The chaplains that uh, were the three chaplains that were appointed in the uh, for the Union Army were still civilians. Uh, there were two hospital chaplains. There were two types of chaplains, hospital chaplains and regimental chaplains. Uh, I don't have the names with me right now. I'm terrible with names. I always need notes. 
Uh, two of them were appointed as hospital chaplains, and one of them is a regimental chaplain who wound up at Gettysburg and actually got wounded himself. And, uh, but that was it. That's all there were. There weren't any official military chaplains until World War I, in which uh, a whole bunch of uh, Jewish chaplains, rabbis in the country volunteered. Uh, Eleven of them were commissioned. And that's the first time we had commissioned officers in uniform as Jewish chaplains. And Chaplain Goldberg, who was mentioned in the video, was also the first the chaplain, the naval chaplain. He was the chaplain that designed the tablets and Star of David as the badge emblem that all chaplains through today uh, wear on their uniform. Okay, Brenda. Hi, thank you for bringing this uh, program to us. And uh, I had never heard of this museum, so I'm quite excited to visit it one day when I get back to DC. Um, as my dad was a B-24 pilot in World War II over out of the European theater. And um, um, it was interesting you mentioned about the dog tags. So my father, I don't know whether it was common, but four out of the 10 crew were Jewish. He seemed mm. to have gotten you know, Jewish colleagues. And, um, but he, I heard over the years, the stories that they would actually change their dog tags when they went out on a mission. So they wouldn't wear their H's and they would wear an alternative dog tag. Had you heard anything about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that happened. Uh, there was always a big debate what to do, particularly with the air crew, a particular debate what to do with the dog tags. Many of them threw them away. Uh, others, when they landed, they buried them. The irony of that is that when they were captured by the Germans, most of them admitted they were Jewish during interrogation. Uh, but as uh, Michael mentioned, uh, the, the Jewish POWs, particularly in the Air Force that I'm aware of, and uh, also in the Army, were treated no different uh, than other POWs. There was one instance where in one uh, camp they were segregated, but they had their meals communal with all the others. And the worst thing that could be said really was that... Uh, the worst anti-Semitism they received were from their own American POWs in the camps. Uh, Berger was mentioned. There was another case where, uh, uh, again, I'm, I, I'm terrible with names, like I said. Uh, a, towards the end of the war, there was an order given to uh, have all the Jewish uh, prisoners in one particular camp come forward. Uh, this was not that they were going to send them to Burgo, which in fact happened in a different uh, camp. But uh, the sergeant in charge of the, uh, that barracks uh, refused to do that. He told the uh, major German major commandant that uh, we were all Jews. The commandant pulled out his pistol, put it up to the sergeant's head and said, you know, I want to see all the Jews. He says, we're all Jews, he says, and if you want, go ahead and shoot me. He says, the war is almost over. We know who you are, <laughs> you know? That's and uh, yeah, and uh, so he put the gun away and walked away. When the camp was evacuated, the, the sergeant also refused to evacuate the, uh, the Jewish, his barracks worth of uh, POWs. Everybody else left, went on a death march. They stayed and when the Americans happened to come through, they were, they were rescued altogether. Thank you. Okay, and a follow-on question from, uh, well, actually, yeah, a question from Marcy Schoenfeld in the chat box. Well, wouldn't the Germans know they were Jewish since they were circumcised? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, there are, a lot of people get circumcised. Even Germans get circumcised. Right. But, uh, not all of them. But <laughs> So let's go back to Anne and Hal Rosenbaum. Uh, you still have your hand up. Do you have a question? And they muted themselves again. Yeah. Well, evidently not. Uh, a couple other things, Sheldon. Uh, with the holdings that you have, uh, can you tell us something about uh, the decisions you make in terms of what you actually display? Do you have a, uh, a warehouse where you have everything else? No, it's not a warehouse. It's just a big room <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> Uh, like most museums, unfortunately, only about 10% of what they have uh, can be displayed. Uh, so uh, 
if you donate something, it, it may or may not ever be displayed. A lot depends on what it is. I mean, uniforms, they have a couple that are displayed. Medals, the only medals that are displayed are from some significant people who really <laughs> earned a bunch of things of that nature. Uh, but I will, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit here right now and, and mention that we are in the process of uh, creating two new exhibits. Actually, one is a modernization of an old exhibit that got turned, torn down when they rebuilt the first floor. But we are now building a Vietnam veterans exhibit downstairs and a women in the military exhibit downstairs. And I guess at this point, I should make a, an economic pitch. So if you're interested in helping uh, donations to the museum for any of those exhibits, or just to the museum itself, are more than welcome. Say, say you're here. I'm here now. David, <laughs> David Hal is here now. OK, Anne is there. No, Hal is here. OK, Hal. If you I uh, was stationed in Pensacola, Florida. And that's the name of our station. It was in the psychology lab with the School of Aviation Medicine. And in addition, I found that we had to drive 42 miles every Friday. I did. I had a car, and I, we took several people because the chief chaplain uh, and the Navy, this Pensacola, refused to allow the Jewish rabbi. And I was asked by the chaplain and commandant of in England, if I would talk to the chaplain and try to get him convinced that we should have a Jewish chaplain on our base. It was a huge base. There were six different fields. It was a teaching base, a research base. And I was on the phone with this man for 45 minutes. And he, all he would say to me was, you could go into town, in town, there are some congregations and the men can go there for services. I said, I want to have my services from uh, a chaplain in the Navy. And he wouldn't even respond to that. And I heard some of the same kinds of things initially when I, we were all lined up and the guy was actually drunk. He was a lieutenant. Uh, he spent you are members of, representatives of your homes, your families, your religions, your races. If members of you do not perform well, others will not be invited back again. I don't know what we're doing about the kinds of things like that that go on, but they seem to it was certainly going on when I was in. And I have no reason to believe that it's had gotten any better. Okay, thank you, Hal. Uh, Rhonda, did you still have your hand up? Yeah. Arnold. Yes. Uh, I was in the service during a Korean conflict, and I remember uh, I was stationed in Tokyo, Japan, and uh, there was one congregation, Jewish congregation there that invited all the Jews to the high holiday services. And I, I attended high holiday services for the Jewish congregation in Tokyo. And it's very interesting. This has happened around. In Southeast Asia, we had circuit riding rabbis that would go from base to base to base. And uh, I was stationed in Thailand at the time, and we had one that uh, went around and he's now a rabbi emeritus in New Jersey somewhere. Very, very nice, very nice guy. By the way, Mr. Yellen, uh, my grandfather's sister married somebody named Yellen. Does your forefathers come from Lunavola or uh, any place up in Belarus? No, but uh, there was a very famous uh, uh, in fact, you might know of him, uh, named by the uh, name of Yellen, who was the last 
combat pilot of not of World War Two that took off from Iwo Jima with a Jerry, flight Jerry, over. Jerry Yellen, yes. Jerry, yeah. oh, Jerry, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, I, I've been in touch with Jerry before he passed away. And the, the funny thing about that, which you might know, is uh, Jerry uh, was in conflict uh, over Japan uh, as the last pilot during World War II. And uh, he eventually married a Japanese girl and the families of uh, her father and Jerry uh, got very familiar and friendly before, uh, after the war. And he married this Japanese girl. Yeah, yeah. He actually flew the mission uh, after the war ended, actually. He, 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 it was he, right at the end, right. When, he, end, when, right. He, land, when he landed the Iwo Jima, the, Lord, the war was over. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, I can't see everybody, so if you have a question, just go, go ahead and uh, speak up. Hi, I'm Don Karp. I just have one comment. I have dog tags that have a J on it. Right. They came later. Yeah, my, this, my, was, this was during the Korean War. Yeah, mine, mine from shortly after the Korean War. Uh, also have a J. They they did away with the H to Hebrew, and now it's just plain Jewish. Yep. Uh, Sheldon. Yes. Uh, my name is Sheldon Katz, and obviously from the time that we were born, that seemed to be the, the only name that mothers could come up with, because <laughs> I never met another living Sheldon. But I served uh, at what was then the beginning months, years of the Cold War. Uh, and I was a navigator doing in-flight refueling, an occupation that others might walk away from. But it made life very interesting to get that close to another plane that couldn't fly as slow as we could, and we could not fly as fast as they could. How we ever transferred the fuel, I leave to God. I did spend some time up in Thule, Greenland, where we uh, refueled, uh, other than training missions, where we refueled uh, planes that were f reconnaissance planes flying the northern border of Russia. And they would, uh, we would refuel them as far, as close to Russia as we could, as we dared or told to. Then they would fly east, I guess, to Alaska uh, overnight or spend the day there and then come back uh, and land at Thule or wherever else they were going to go. So that was an interesting time, um, very seldom remembered, and it was the early months and years of the Cold War. Well, let me, let me tell you, first of all, that uh, when I was in elementary school, I was one of two other Sheldons. There were three Sheldons in the same class. So there's a whole slew of them here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm not alone in that respect. But if you think uh, flying as a navigator in a refueler is dangerous, you should fly in a fighter plane like I did on the back end. And I've done refueling from the back end of the F-4. And that's, that is something else. So anyway, but uh, thank you for your service. And thank you for being a refueler. You helped us God knows how many times during the war in Vietnam. Thank you. Okay, Larry Ginsburg. And Yes. Uh, um, unfortunately, I, I've got time for one more. Unfortunately, yeah. 11 o'clock, I have my own meeting I have to chair. So right. I'll take one more question. And if anybody still has questions, please give them to David. David will send them to me and I will do my best to answer them. Do you have uh, anything in the museum concerning Jews who fought in the Spanish-American War? Because I know the uh, commandant of the battleship Maine was Jewish. The, the only we don't have anything in the museum, but when I do give my talks on uh, Jews in the defense of the United States, I do talk about uh, the Spanish American War very briefly. Uh, allegedly, the first Jew killed uh, going up San Juan Hill was Jewish. The uh, not the commandant of the Maine, but the executive officer was, I believe, he was the executive officer was Jewish and he led the commission that investigated the sinking of the Maine. 
So I do know that much about uh, what went on during the Spanish-American War. And I forgot, I do also have in my lecture notes how many Jews, apparent, approximately how many Jews and officers, Jewish officers served during that war. Thank you. Okay, but, so uh, Sheldon, thank you so much. It's just a wonderful program. I think uh, we all enjoyed it. I it's my pleasure. Very my good. pleasure. Thank you for showing up in such good numbers. I really appreciate that. It makes me feel that what we're doing is, is worthwhile. Yes, Stephen, so. nice seeing you again. You got a great chapter there. And for members. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your presentation. And uh, I enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. It was really great. And to the members of your Holocaust Society, thank you so very much for, for coming and listening to me. Okay, and we'll I, stay I need stuff. to go. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay, well, again, uh, thank you all for coming. The, uh, to watch this without a tear in your eye is very tough. It was a very moving presentation. And uh, I must thank you, uh, David, for setting it up with Sheldon and with Stephen. And uh, thank you so much. It was excellent. And uh, I, I thank everyone for coming. We had a very nice turnout. And uh, we do have some really fabulous programs for those of you who, uh, who've been able to join us. And there'll be more coming up. And Marcy's doing a great job. And frankly, again, great tribute to, uh, to David and Alyssa for running our organization through here. And we certainly, for those of you who are not members of our organization or who would like to become more active, uh, I'm here. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. And uh, take care, everyone.